Welcome. I'm Rich Free. I'm the president and CEO of the RG Group. At the RG Group, we transform manufacturing services through technology to help our customers be more successful. I'm here today to share something that's very close to, close to my heart, and that is sort of the evolution of manufacturing services over the last 35 years that I've been doing this. So for a long period of time, I've helped manufacturers, U.S.-based manufacturers, in their service side of their business. Um, and I'd like to share with you a little bit of how that's changed over that time period. So let me begin with a couple general observations about manufacturing. Most of you know the statistic, but maybe you don't. For every direct manufacturing job that is created, somewhere between two and five additional service jobs are created. So when you think about that, that multiplier effect is why manufacturing is such a, an important part of any economic development plan. plan. Whether it's local or national, manufacturing jobs count because of that multiplying factor. So if you think about it, this is why states vie for getting manufacturers to move in. It's why they offer tax incentives. It's why they do a wide variety of things, including giving people money to lure them in. Why? Because over time, that manufacturer may not bring a lot of tax revenue in, but all the support function goes around it will. So manufacturing matters. Now let's begin with the big question. So what's manufacturing like in today's environment? Well, I can tell you this. I'm certain that it's very uncertain. There's a lot of volatility. There's a lot of question marks around all the things that we talk about on a regular daily basis, such as regulations, such as tax reform. All those things that buy into our personal minds are also part of the manufacturing sector. But here's one thing I can tell you for sure. Manufacturers want to reduce the number of folks that are on their payroll, not because they're mean, because they're trying to be effective. And they want to do that for three specific reasons. One, the cost of health care. Two, the fact they can't, can't find skilled, even skilled, semi-skilled labor, let alone they can't find the technical expertise they need from engineering and other high-level responsibilities. So in a nutshell, what we're seeing is manufacturing, manufacturing companies need to do more with less, which all sort of brings us to the evolution of the service sector, which is why we're here today. So let's kind of take a step back in what I like to call the Wayback Machine and talk about that evolution. The evolution of the service business as it pertains to serving manufacturing. So it began with a very, very simple business model. It's what I call the brand and turf model. And what that means is that in a particular area, a supply chain was looking for someone that had that brand in that area. Why? Logistics. They needed to have that product when they needed it, and they needed it quickly. So they were looking for, do you have that brand? Do you have it in stock? And how soon can I get it? That was the way supply chain began back in the days of B2B, which is, is frankly in the 70s. That was really what it was all about. It was tied to your brand, and it was tied to your turf. Well, guess what, folks? We all know what changed. What changed was the internet. So today, the source of supply can be in California and can still be on the East Coast in a day or two. And if you're, if you're competing with Amazon, it's there the same day or the next day. So things have changed dramatically with logistics. So this particular, uh, this particular business model and value proposition is not really very helpful in today's manufacturing service business. So what's happened is the, the service providers are saying, I need to do more. I need to create some sort of a partnership in supply chain to help these manufacturers drive down their costs. Because if I don't do that, I won't be in business. And so what's really happening here is a bit of a transfer. They're transferring, the manufacturers are transferring those costs over the distribution side or supply chain, and everybody's happy. We all know what's going on. We have to do it. We have to take those costs and reduce them for the manufacturer. How do we do that? A variety of value-added services, including uh, VMI, vendor managed inventory, Kanban, just another name for it, consignment, kidding, and of course, customer single sourcing. All these things reduce the soft cost for a manufacturer. So it takes that transitional 
and transactional costs and drives it down to make it much more effective for the supply chain in the short term and sometimes in the long term. This is sort of the first step from that really brand and turf side up to the supply chain partnership. And this has been going on for a long period of time and it's still a very, very viable service uh, offered to manufacturers. But what's now taking place is that next generation of outsourcing. And now we're outsourcing technical expertise. As I spoke before, we talked about the lack of skilled expertise. So think about it. I'm a manufacturer that maybe had 10 folks in maintenance and maybe I had 10 engineers on staff. Today I have maybe four of each or three of each, but dramatically reduced staff. Why? A, brain drain, they can't find folks to fill those jobs, and B, there's just not enough of them to go around. It's what's so critical in our, in our society right now. So what the smart and strategic suppliers are providing is on-demand technical expertise. And this is manifested in a wide variety of ways. It could be hose assembly manufacturer. It could be installation or preventive maintenance, and clearly could be component repair and training. All those are technical services on demand when you need them, but guess what? Only when you need them and only when someone is willing to pay for them. So that's that next level up of the value proposition. And if you continue down or up that path would be a better way to put it, you're now moving kind of from a component-based service to a complete service-based business model. And the next step up is outsourcing that engineering expertise. So that could be anything from building a one-of-a-kind or a final assembly for a customer. Could be provide engineering as a service because in a lot of cases, customers need someone to come in and do a feasibility study or they might need someone to come in and do a, a reality check is another term that we sometimes use for that. That's something that uh, we see strategic partners asking for quite, quite a bit. And here's the big one. This is what's driving most manufacturers today. I said earlier, they have to do more with less. Some of that is people and some of it is machine. So productivity engineering, which most manufacturers don't have the ability to do in-house, that can be outsourced. And that is automation, robotics, the combination of all those factors. How do you take that production line, make it more effective, drive down the costs, and you can't afford, most manufacturers cannot afford to do that internally. They want to outsource that engineering expertise. Why? Because they may only do it every couple of years. So you're not going to do that every day. You don't need to have a staff of, of 16 manufacturing engineers. If I can get five manufacturing engineers on demand when I need it, working on my project, and then guess what? They're not on my payroll. They're on the other guy's payroll. That's that shifting of costs on demand that we talked about earlier. So one more step up, what we're now beginning to see, this is kind of interesting, is the actual outsourcing of manufacturing. Now this is not the bad outsourcing. This is not moving it to Mexico or moving it to China or something like this. This is moving it internally within the U.S. And the reason that manufacturers are doing it, they're basically saying, maybe I'm a startup. I don't want to get started in the manufacturing business. It's expensive. I need people, I need machines, I need expertise. How do I start? Maybe they don't need to start. Maybe they start with a partner. The other part that we're seeing a lot of interest in is established manufacturers. That for whatever reason, reorganization, an uneven demand, whatever it might be, say, you know what? I can do this manufacturing, but I prefer to have someone else do it. And that's why we like to call it outsourced flexible manufacturing services because Sometimes you need them at this level, sometimes you don't, but it gives that customer or that manufacturer the ability to outsource everything. It can be from the feasibility study to the first of a kind to a number of prototypes to final assembly and engineering and warranty turnkey. It basically relieves them of all of the manufacturing costs that they have, and all they have to do is market and somebody else takes care of making it for them in the U.S. So it's insourcing versus outsourcing, even though we're kind of calling it outsourcing. So there is just a wide, wide range of value-added services that have all come in play because of the challenge in supply chain to be that 
brand and turf type solution. So it's really an exciting time to be in the supply chain and the distribution business. And we look at it as a challenge and an opportunity. And we really think that there's great opportunity for lots of businesses out there. We think manufacturing will continue to come back. And we're very excited to be able to share with you today what we think about when we think about the evolution of manufacturing services. So thanks for spending some time with me today. Once again, Rich Free RG Group. I hope to uh, talk with you soon. Thanks very much.